Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to this next in the series of um, our Africa EU debating um, platform where we bring together commissioners both from the EU and Africa to debate matters of heart that are central to the relationship, uh, the current relationship and the future relationship between the EU and Africa. Again, um, this has been quite a pattern actually for us in that we have three powerful women who are going to speak to us, share with us their thoughts um, on the issue of health, welfare and prosperity with a particular focus around health matters, um, which is going to be key, obviously, for both continents' recovery into the medium to long-term future. As ever, we're very pleased to welcome Commissioner Jutta Urpelainen, who is the lead commissioner on behalf of the e European Commission, who's been here stolidly, uh, a, sto a stoic person that's been in charge of making sure that she is the face of this debating uh, e uh, Africa EU series. And it's a very a great opportunity again, like last Thursday and this Thursday, Thursday it's Yuta and myself and others debating Africa. So Yuta, very, uh, thank, for a very warm welcome to you. Firstly, very briefly tell us why is it important that we're here discussing this particular topic uh, that builds on the series that we have so far. Over to you and warm welcome Yuta. Thank you. It's uh, great to have Thursday, and it's great to be here with you again. Um, I'm very delighted to continue this um, debate in Africa with extremely important topic. I'm also very happy to have with me two dear colleagues, two powerful ladies, as, as you were saying, Commissioner Kiriakidis, Stella, and Commissioner El Fadil. When human development is high, economies are more resilient and countries more peaceful and societies more equal. As the whole world is suffering from COVID-19 pandemic, the crisis has unfortunately wiped away and wiped out the progress of recent years in many countries in Africa. For the first time since 1998, poverty is on the rise. The pandemic could push between 26 million to 39 million more people into poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa. I am very proud of our Team Europe response in Africa. We have collectively with our member states as Team Europe, allocated around 8 billion euros in support to Africa. But it is our job now to look to the long-term solutions, especially for Africa's youth, to provide them with sufficient opportunities. As emphasized in March, in our Africa strategy, we must drive broader social and human development with new opportunities. Those opportunities are the green and digital transformation, which we have been discussing with our previous uh, online sessions, as well as the African demographic development. Therefore, we need to harness all of these ideas and support people, especially women, the younger generations, and the most vulnerable. So we must work together to fight COVID-19 pandemic and also prepare our health systems globally to face new crises. So with these words, I'm looking forward to have a great debate. And especially, I'm very delighted that Stella, my dear colleague, who has been at the heart, in the core of the fight against COVID-19 pandemic, that Stella is uh, with us today. Thank you. Yuta, ever, th as ever, thank you very much for setting the context and the tone for this conversation. Very much appreciated. Just want to, uh, before I bring in the other two commissioners, just a warm welcome again to our Zoom audience and our live stream audience. And just a little bit about the rules of the game. Um, make sure your videos are on, make sure you're on mute. mute. And uh, when we break into asking questions and having the opportunity to engage with commissioners, what I'd like you to do is make sure you use your virtual hand. And in those of you who don't know where it is, go on to participants, click on there and you'll 
find it. And if you put it up, your virtual hand will be able to locate you and find you, and I'll be able to bring you in. Those of you on live stream, uh, fear not. Use hashtag debating Africa EU um, to post your questions or queries, and then we'll make sure that you are also included in this discussion. Um, as Yuta said, we have two, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have two powerful women talking about uh, both the broader context of the relationship between EU and Africa, but in this context about what we can learn from each other, because it's not a one-way street, what we can learn from each other, but actually how we can actually gain value by collaborating differently and better into the future and now. So I want to turn firstly to Commissioner El Fadil. Amira, very warm welcome to you. There we go. I just need, uh, excellent, welcome, welcome to you, Amira. Um, and thank you for joining this debate. Um, I wanted to kind of, let's cut to the chase here in the sense that we know the numbers. There's no point repeating them. We know about the horrendous impact both in Europe and Africa. We know about the, tra the trajectory of, you know, what's going to happen to demographics. We know about infrastructure. What are you doing at the AU? What are you doing um, in terms of uh, responding to the impact that you're encountering uh, in various parts and across Africa. A very warm welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much and greetings to my two colleagues, the two commissioners, and to you as the moderator and to all the audience uh, via the live stream or joining us through Zoom. Uh, the partnership between the African Union Commission and the European Union Commission is one of our strategic partners. Mm -hmm. And we have a very good level of cooperation in the different sectors. Uh, in this webinar, I think we will concentrate about what do we have in the health sector between the two commissions. And I would like to start by saying that uh, Africa uh, decided as a continent uh, to fight COVID-19 pandemic uh, in solidarity and in unity. But this is very important to us because this fight when uh, the heads of the states and government decided to do it uh, together, they have assigned the chairperson of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Musa Baki uh, Muhammad, to lead this fight through the commission, but within the commission, the fight to be led by our uh, technical institution, Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So this, uh, the vision in Africa on how to fight COVID-19 is in place, because we have already uh, approved our anti-COVID-19 continental strategy on the ministerial level in an emergency meeting to the ministers of health in February. But after that, it was endorsed by the Bureau of the Assembly of the Heads of States and Government, uh, chaired by President Ramaphosa, uh, the chair of the African Union of the Year. So what I wanted to say at the beginning that Africa decided on fighting uh, this COVID-19 together. There is uh, political will uh, uh, to fight this COVID-19. There is an agreement on fighting COVID-19 in unity. At the same time, they decided, our heads of state and government, that we will extend our hand to our partners all the development partners because we uh, realized from the beginning and they realized from the beginning that uh, no country will be safe unless every country is safe mm -hmm. and this uh, COVID-19 is affecting Africa is affecting Europe is affecting America everywhere it's a pandemic it's global so while we decided on our African solidarity we have opened our doors we have talked to all our partners that we need a global solidarity, not just an Africa solidarity. Because even Africa, if Africa is free of COVID-19, it will not be really free if our neighbors are not free from COVID-19. This is this is my first my first uh, remark. I would like to, to to share with you that we are seeking solidarity with Europe in fighting COVID-19. We have already engaged on the political level. There is an engagement on the political, highest political level, and there is uh, cooperation, and there is uh, work technical, on the technical level between Africa CDC and Europe CDC. And this is started since March. We have a relationship before COVID-19, of course, but working to fight COVID-19, we have been exchanging information with uh, Europe CDC. We have 
uh, experts working with us. We are sharing information with them. They are sharing information with us. Uh, we are uh, learning from the best practices in Europe. Europe is learning from the best practices in Africa. And we have uh, and, uh, channels of cooperation on all levels, I said, starting from the highest political level going down uh, to the technical level. So there's unity, solidarity, which I'm sure is not a dig at what's happened in Europe by any chance, but it's not lost, uh, lost on us that you know, there is clearly that sense of coming together in the, in the African Union, which is great to hear. But Amira, that, all of that sounds too rosy and too um, fantastic. We have an audience here of citizens, politicians, academics, institutions. They want to hear practically so what are you what are the some of the things i mean you've heard it's yes, been in the I press think. about the lack of uh, consistency about masks the lack of ppe equipment the whole sense that people are going to go inwards and go break globalized value and supply chains is nothing like that happening over in africa you're saying to me there is there is when i spoke about these positive uh, issues happening in africa it doesn't mean we it doesn't mean we have no challenges we have sure. challenges and uh, these challenges were identified also from the beginning. And I will mention some of the challenges. From the beginning, when this COVID-19 started in February, at the end of February, we uh, went into uh, looking into the area of diagnostics. Mm -hmm. We found out that in February, that only two laboratories in the whole continent, and out of the 55 member states, only two countries have the capacity to diagnose uh, COVID-19. Yeah. This is one of the first challenges we identified. But I can tell you what we did to overcome or to resolve this challenge. We started immediately with WHO and with other partners. We started technical uh, training uh, to uh, our technical staff, uh, to the laboratories in Africa, uh, to raise up the capacity to make sure that they will have uh, the capability to diagnose. And within three months, we have managed to raise up the number of the countries that they can do the test, they can diagnose to 48 member states. Only in three months' time, we have trained the lab technicians. And this is a real story. Okay. All your audience, they can check it yeah. and they can verify it. I will tell you another challenge. Go, yes. Also, we have in Africa, very few countries uh, manufacture um, uh, BBEs or masks or all the medical equipment needed for COVID-19. It was a big challenge for us. It was a big challenge for us because we have to buy, we have to purchase from different manufacturers. But what we did at the beginning, we opened for our countries. They did. They started doing it individually. It was difficult. Then we agreed on a full procurement processes that instead of of our countries to go on an individual basis to look for a manufacturer in uh, in Europe or in uh, China and to buy. No, we have established an electronic platform. And and we, this has been done by also the participation of the private sector in Africa. Okay. This is Strive Masewa, mm -hmm. Strive Masewa, a well-known uh, businessman mm -hmm. from, from, from uh, Zimbabwe. And he's well-known. He's the one assigned uh, to do this job. He did it. Uh, he created with the private sector in Africa an electronic platform for the medical supplies. Okay. This one platform mm. it is negotiated, and also you can check online the information. They can, every member state in Africa they can go online. They can purchase through this platform. The prices are already negotiated by this uh, electronic platform. Uh, they uh, they also negotiated the, the qualities and the quantities that's needed. There is a projection also of the needs of the membership. And this is also a story I'm telling you. Uh, it's not just something we are dreaming of. It is something happening. Okay. It's the reality of what we are doing around now. Thank you for responding. For example, <laughs> no, 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 it's okay, because we need to move on. I want to bring I want to bring the next commissioner from the EU in. But, but that's lovely. And thank you for responding to my challenge effectively. And I welcome views from our people who are participating. And what I want all of you to do is think about there's great. We're all very good at saying what the problem is sometimes but we're not what the solutions might be so in the context of developing this relationship into the future what do we want what do you both want what do we both need in this relationship which is political social and economic so on that note uh, a warm welcome to commissioner kiriakidis hello stella hello. Good, good afternoon good very afternoon. 
lovely to welcome you. Um, as uh, Uta said, you know, you've been uh, you know, at the forefront um, of helping the Commission and the Union think about and develop responses to um, COVID and the virus. From your perspective, tell us, what do we need to have in place in terms of tackling the pandemic together? Um, as two continents, because one thing that's been missing in the, across the globe is a lot of the male political le leaders have turned inwards and have been saying the most ridiculous things only yesterday, as you know. How do we as two continents work together differently, better and show a different way of working in collaboration? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say hello to both my uh, colleagues, the commissioners uh, and everyone else uh, in uh, on this meeting. And just to touch a few points, and hopefully we'll have time to answer some questions. Uh, undeniably, the pandemic has uh, brought some facts into sharper focus. Mm. I'd say that, first of all, we've uh, come to understand our connect connectedness, um, not only in relation to our economies, but also in relation to global health. The second fact that has come into perspective is that uh, the ability for any community, any society to thrive um, depends very much and is linked to health. And the third, uh, I think, fact that has come into perspective with COVID-19 is that we really do need to have more robust, more resilient health systems to be able to respond and tackle a situation as we are faced now with uh, COVID-19. So I'm really very, very pleased to be able to join you today. Uh, I sincerely believe that EU and Africa are natural partners. Uh, and I'm delighted to be given the opportunity by my dear colleague and friend Yuta to join. And um, I'll share a, a little personal um, aspect to this because um, I have a special um, bond with Africa. We, we have visited several times because my mother was born in Africa mm -hmm. uh, many years ago. So uh, it, it is a continent that uh, really is very close and dear to my heart. Uh, Utah has already touched on a number of the issues that uh, uh, COVID-19 has impacted on in Africa. Um, and uh, she has already called out for solidarity and I could not but mention and, and support her call. Uh, I would want to say that what we have all realized is that we need to have a stronger crisis preparedness and management of all health threats. And this is not only mm -hmm. Um, in, in Africa, but I would say that this is something we also saw at the EU. Indeed. And at the last uh, World Health Assembly, the EU took the lead to have a world, um, a landmark resolution on bringing the world together to tackle COVID-19. So I think that what we need to, we've moved forward and uh, we need to understand that we need na stronger national health systems, support systems at the global level. At the EU level, and we are moving forward now with a new package on lessons learned from COVID-19. We have already uh, decided that we're going to work towards strengthening uh, our European Medicines Agency and our European Centre for Disease Prevention and of Control. Um, and it has become clear that we need to possibly build a new European agency uh, to prepare and address health crisis. Mm. President von der Leyen last week in her State of the Union speech spoke of a stronger uh, European Union for health. And I think this shows that health is a priority that we are uh, all addressing now uh, in relation also to COVID. Uh, the EU has really, I think, had a global leading role uh, as Team Europe to help partners deal with the pandemic. Uh, together, we generated over 16 billion euro in pledges through the global coronavirus uh, response sure. to support COVID-19 diagnostics and vaccines and therapeutics, because we need to understand that all, the only real way out of this pandemic is to find a safe and effective vaccine, and that needs to be available for the whole world. Uh, we confirmed our, partic our participation in the COVAX facility, uh, the vaccine pillar of the access to the COVID-19 uh, tools accelerator. Uh, but here I would say that, and I have already made this call 
um, last week that more funding is necessary. The UN highlighted that we need um, about 35 million, uh, billion more for the accelerator. Uh, South Africa, together with Norway, are chairing the Facilitation Council, of which I had the privilege of taking part in the meeting uh, next week. So mm -hmm. there is an international dimension to, to COVID, a global dimension that we are very, very committed to and already involved with. Uh, these are important steps, but this is going to be a long journey. And Indeed. we still have a long time to go. Uh, our multilateralism is vital to our success and we need to work together with all the European Union agencies, with WHO, with, of course, all the agencies and the African continent. Uh, my uh, uh, colleague um, uh, from uh, the African Union said, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I, I believe that is something that we all know and have realized. So it is not a time that we can be and look within our borders. Virus is no, no borders, and we really need to pull together and support each and every corner of the globe in order to come out of this pandemic. And with those thoughts, I leave you and thank you again. No, sir, thank you so much. You know, when, you, when we all think about what the daily news reports are about political leadership, and invariably, I know I make a gendered issue, but it means mostly men, male political leaders. And hearing you three, I wish the whole kind of, there could be a global media can hear the kind of leadership approach your three, you three are demonstrating and that we need, which is about solidarity, interdependence, and coming together around a common sense that actually, uh, if one falls, we all fall. There's something there that we know. It's a historic uh, message and it's a historical message we seem to have lost sight of. Stella, I want to just come back to you very briefly, if I may, before I take, and all of you in the audience, I am coming to you. What about the private sector here? Because there's something about the fact that you've got a private sector that connects into Africa and back, and it seems like health and digital are likely to be the accelerators in this space to a great extent. So just for Stella and Amira, just to think about that question, but Stella, come back to you first, very briefly. Well, we, we, very, we mobilized the private sector uh, from the beginning of this pandemic okay. at all levels, mm -hmm. uh, and it uh, the private sector has really come together in terms of increasing our capacity to produce personal protective equipment within the European Union because uh, uh, we, we did have uh, uh, problems there in terms of uh, access. Um, the private sector in terms of pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. uh, has been in close contact with us continuously to address medicine shortages um, and accessibility to medicines from the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that when we're dealing with a pandemic and we need to understand this is an unprecedented public yeah. health crisis, mm. no one was able to predict, I think, uh, uh, 10 months ago, what we would be faced with. There are, no, there are no rules about how to proceed with it because if this is the first time we're faced with this. Sure. So sometimes we need out of the box and everybody needs to come together. Mm. We cannot say that there are... Um, uh, that that we can afford not to use every single partner, whether private or public sector, and across the globe in order to deal with this. And this is about real solidarity, as Yuta said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amira. Yes. Um, I think the private sector in Africa uh, were engaged also from the beginning. And uh, we had a previous uh, experience with the private sector in, in Africa during the Ebola time. Uh, they participated in fighting Ebola uh, when it happened okay. in West African countries. This time, the private sector also uh, was engaged from the beginning. There was a meeting called upon by uh, President Ramaphosa, the chair of the union, and he invited uh, many entities from the private sector. He appointed six Russian envoys uh, for uh, for um, resource mobilization for the fighting COVID-19, plus also for looking into uh, the communications or more uh, close links with the international financial institutions. Okay. Uh, I mentioned just I just give me one minute, please. Mm, of course. I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier uh, the medical supplies platform. Uh, this platform is also uh, being established by the African private sector. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, this is one of the examples 
of the cooperation between the public sector and the private sector in Africa. And it's really a very successful uh, platform. It is even led by uh, the private sector. We have also established uh, anti-COVID-19 response fund. This has been established by the African Union. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, representation of uh, three representatives uh, from the private sector as part uh, of this uh, board of trustees of the fund. The chair of the board of trustees is from uh, the private sector, Professor Orama, uh, the chair or uh, the president of the African Bank. So the involvement of the private sector is, is so much needed in Africa, yeah. and I believe also in Europe. But, Indeed. And to end uh, this question or to end this answer, uh, we need the, the the links between the private sector in Europe and the private sector in Africa. Absolutely. This is what we need to speak about, that there are the private sector in Europe, that was just mentioned by Madam Stella, that they are already engaged. I'm mentioning to you that the private sector in Africa are, is already part of the fight of COVID-19, but is how to make sure that within the partnership we have between the two commissions, we can link the two together. We Excellent. The private sector in Africa and the private sector. Brilliant. So you've given thank us a very, thank you, Amira. So you've given us our first very practical uh, recommendation. How do you, you as commissioners bring together and lead the private sector on both parties, both sides to come together to work in a different and better way uh, whilst ensuring competition, but also solidarity. I'm going to bring our audience in. Uh, you've been very patient. Thank you very much. I'm going to take Anna. Anna, where are you? Anna H. Firstly, I need you to unmute and then just be very specific and clear if you can. It's, your, it's a question or a comment and who to? Well, welcome. Anna, we can't hear you. Might be your volume. Unmute yourself again. Hello? No. Okay, Anna, we'll try and sort your volume out. Um, and I'm going to go to the next uh, question from Dr. Salah. Salah? Hello? You're mute. Hello. Mu Hello. Hello. Absolutely. A very warm welcome. Please introduce yourself and your question who it's to. Yes, my, my name is Abdullah, and I am a senior lecturer at, uh, uh, my, at the University of Manchester here in the United Kingdom. Uh huh. Uh, my question actually relates to the point uh, you and Amina have both highlighted, which is entrepreneurship. Uh, we, we have realized that since uh, uh, we look at post-independent Africa uh, 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 over the past 50, 60 years, the realization of a fully industrialized Africa has really emerged. Mm -hmm. And many have attributed this to the uh, this the intensification of institutional voids in Africa, whether mm -hmm. it's corruption, poor leadership, poor infrastructure, weak uh, physical monetary policies. Um, and the, the outcome is that Africa currently represents less than four or five percent of the global market. Yes. So when you take a country like Brazil, Brazil alone, you know, has a has a better global share of the global market than the whole of Africa put together. So my, my question is, uh, um, to all three commissioners, basically, uh, uh, what is Europe doing, uh, uh, apart from just giving aid uh, 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 and financial support, uh, uh, what is Europe doing in this relationship to help or to, to work with Africa to become a, a fully industrialized... Dr. Salah, uh, thank you. Continue? Thank you. And what I'd like you to do, and I don't want you to answer this question directly, but post it, is what would you like to see happen? So put it in the chat what it is that you would like to see happen um, as a result of this relationship. I'm going to move on to Bora. Your video is off. Yes. Can you, can you see me? Can you hear me? I can now. Hello. Warm welcome. Very briefly introduce yourself and the question. Hello. Brussels. My name is Bora Kamwanya, and I'm the Secretary General of uh, the ACP YPN, so it's the African, Caribbean, and Pacific uh, Young Professional Network. We wow. are based in Brussels. Okay. Warm well, welcome. Uh, the ACP is um, youth matters in ACP. Um, my, my question was, uh, what are the lessons learned, uh, both from the AU and the EU, 
um, you know, on the, the partnership, the AU, the Africa-Europe partnership in time of um, you know, we are facing a situation in which um, cities, countries, uh, regions uh, are taking decisions uh, unilaterally, sorry. Um, and uh, sometimes these decisions are seen as a bit selfish on the other part. So what are the lessons learned here and how will the okay. EU uh, go forward? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And again, Bora, I'd say the same thing to you. I'd love to have your response to my question is what would you like? What would you like? Because these are commissioners listening and wanting to take account of your views on how we shape the future strategy and relationship between Africa and the EU. I'm going to move to Nihad. So put it on the chat. Nihad? Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. So my Thank you. My name is Wildali Nihad. I'm uh, the head of uh, communication of the Zayel Khair Hazib Ahbah, Algeria. So my question Where are you is, based at, right now? Where are you, Nihad? I'm home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we cannot go out, so... No, indeed. No, I was just thinking which country you're in, but you're obviously back at... Algeria. Yeah, Algeria, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So my question is to Mrs. Um, al Al-Fadi. You spoke about global solidarity and we should like make changes in healthcare and everything. But uh, for example, in my country, we had problems in healthcare way before coronavirus, way before everything. Yeah. So, so that will be very difficult considering that when there weren't a pandemic, we were in a trouble. So uh, second, of, uh, you spoke about funding. Uh, we don't have a problem with funding, for example, but uh -huh. still we have problems in healthcare. Yes. So uh, I read the, the other day that Dr. Anthony Pushy, the, um, the uh, White House uh, coronavirus advisor, spoke that humanity may enter a pandemic era. So my question is, should we think about healthcare or reconsider our whole way of life altogether. Yeah, good. Very good question. And again, um, I use the chat function if you can post some of your thoughts and views so we can capture this and then feed it back to commissioners. I really welcome you doing that. I'm going to try again. And um, and um, and Helen. Unfortunately, your volume's not working. I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm going to because I need to keep it keep it moving. So I'm going to go to Iman. Iman A. Iman. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, warm welcome to you. Okay, I'm Iman Ahmed and I am uh, the humanitarian energy co helpline for you in NDPOI. And my question is for all the commissioners, but specifically for Her Excellency Amina El Fadil. So, when we were talking about how you end up actually increasing the number of uh, the health facilities from 35 member states to 48 member states, which is very amazing. I was thinking, why can't we implement such a system before such a pandemic or health crisis has hit the continent? Because I feel like we're not ready for the future. So what are what did we learn from this and what are we planning to do so that we can create a health infrastructure that is very resilient and that would not be affected to this extent? And other than that, we have talked about this medical uh, digitalization platform or medical yeah. equipment platform. Mm -hmm. So and Africa is not digitalized yet, and we are way behind. So what are we working on in order to create a system in Africa where we can have more access like this? So what are your plans and what are your work that you have been doing so far? And those are my questions. Thank you. Iman, thank you. Where are you right now? I am in Istanbul at the moment. OK. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. Welcome and thank you for that very effective set of questions. Okay, commissioners, I'm going to come back to you. So can I start with Stella? If you can briefly respond to that, because I've got 15 minutes left and I want to get more questions in. Um, if you're going to think about what are you doing? So you had that you know, powerful statement about um, the entrepreneurs and private sector in terms of industrialization um of of the e you know of africa and eu uh, africa relationship and the and the wider questions about uh, are we now needing to move into a different kind of context of being pandemic era in terms of changing our lives and uh, fundamentally rethinking how can we create infrastructure which is prepared and ready rather than on the back foot stella well i'll i'll, I'll try and be as brief as possible because a lot of the questions were uh, i think need to be picked up by, by uh, Lieutenant Almeida. Of course. I'll 
thing. When, when asking if we moved into a different era after the pandemic, I, I, we all realized that nothing is going to be very similar to what we knew before this pandemic. A lot of things have changed and we have to readjust ways of life, ways we work. Um, uh, and of course, uh, part of this is also in terms of, of, of the way of the private sector and industry work. But I want to pick up the question that came on solidarity uh, and working together and what we've learned. Uh, at the beginning of this pandemic within the European Union, uh, at the very, very beginning, it was uh, a challenge to bring all 27 member yeah. states on board uh, because everybody felt that this virus could be contained within borders. Uh, as, we, as it progressed uh, very early on, uh, everybody realized that in order to face a global pandemic, you need to work together and you need to be able to uh, cooperate at the level that uh, you'll be able to be effective in uh, fighting the virus. So what we did uh, and what we are continuously doing at the level of the European Union is uh, together with the member states, really working together to coordinate their uh, strategies uh, in terms of what they should be doing to uh, fight the virus uh, with recommendations um, and also uh, trying to be as proactive as possible, uh, trying to see what we can do uh, down the line in order to contain the epidemic. For, for, for myself, the uh, principle of solidarity in an interconnected world is not something we should be debating. I think it's there and it's it's a fact. Uh, so uh, in that sense, we need to really find the best ways to cooperate, uh, not only within the European Union, but across continents in order to deal with this unprecedented health crisis. And as I said at the beginning, we learned out of this, that we need to strengthen our agencies. Yeah. And out of this came a proposal for a very ambitious program, EU for Health, mm -hmm. a large part of which is involved in crisis preparedness and health systems resilience. Mm -hmm. Stella, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really am pleased that all of you are continuing to reinforce what seems like a dirty word and concept is multilateralism. And, you know, we're seeing a retreat from it. And I just hope that this context creates the opportunity for perhaps at EU Africa, Africa EU, to create a different form of multilateralism which others can follow rather than the reliance simply on the West to, to create something of a new order to deal with our circumstances. Um, Amira, do you want to respond to some of the questions that were raised around industrialization, the fact that, you know, why does it take uh, adversity in a crisis to really become prepared? And what we, do we learn from that as we move ahead? Amira, over to you. Briefly as well. Yeah, thank like you. Like Stella. Yes, Great. I will try. I will try to be very brief. Uh, answering to the questions uh, that were raised by first by, by the two uh, from uh, I think uh, Europe I think the mm -hmm. two countries but I will I will I will look into the content of the questions. The question about the industrialization uh, actually Africa is heading towards the industrialization and uh, the core of the partnership between the com the two commissions between the African Union Commission and the European Union Commission. And if you look into even the new Europe strategy towards Africa, it's not about uh, a donor recipient uh, strategy. It's not mm -hmm. like that. It's a strategy looking into the common objectives. It's a strategy looking into the development of the two continents. What Africa is looking for is more development for the continent because our challenges, the challenges we have right now in the continent, whether in the health, uh, sector, sector or in the other sectors, it all all can be addressed through more development in the continent. So addressing issues to do with poverty alleviation, uh, issues to do with uh, creating more jobs in the continent because we have high, high rates of unemployment while we have 60% of our population in Africa is young. Mm -hmm. So exactly. some, of the, the areas, some of the areas of the partnership speaks about the skills it speaks about knowledge transfer. It speaks about uh, investment, investing in Africa and uh, helping the economies in different countries in Africa. So industrialization is an objective. We are working towards it. We are uh, looking to uh, the support of our partners like the European Union. This is for the first question. But also to add uh, to the first uh, question that 
now we have launched the Africa CFTA. So Africa very soon will become one trade zone. And this is economic integration. It will also support the continent to rise up uh, to overcome uh, some of these challenges I just mentioned. So AC, uh, the Africa uh, CFTA is being launched on the 20th of July amid this COVID-19. There is a delay because of COVID-19, but uh, I can assure you that uh, the, the member states, the heads of the states in Africa, they are very serious about the implementation of uh, the free trade area. Uh, the second and the third question I can answer it together. Why are we uh, addressing these issues among this crisis? Issues to do with uh, the um, capacity of our, our public health institutions. Yes, our health institutions in Africa is fragile in most of our members. I, will, I don't want to generalize because I know there is some, some countries in Africa who are doing very well and they exactly, have yeah. strong health systems, but the majority, they have fragile health systems. What we are doing at the African Union and Africa CDC and the other two divisions of health is we are using this crisis of COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. okay. Through it, we are trying to build the capacity of the, our public health institutions in Africa. Sure. This is something we are addressing because we know there is weaknesses, not because of COVID-19, the weaknesses are before COVID-19. But COVID-19 is an opportunity for the African Union, okay. and for the member states and for the, depart the partners to make sure that we can strengthen these public health uh, Thank you. Yeah. Sure that it will address. And finally, we, were, we, want, we need a comprehensive approach of addressing this issue. Health is not, cannot be addressed at healthcare alone. You have to look into a comprehensive approach. You have to bring in the social dimensions. You have to bring of in course the you do. economic dimensions. Of course so you do. Can address it I mean, but you'll forgive. Uh, thank you. Uh, but um, I'm running out of time and I need to finish on the dot at four uh, for various reasons, and not least because commissioners have to go and do even more important things and speak at different uh, fora. Um, but um, you'll forgive the young people who have voiced their concern. I think, I think it's important that politicians listen, that actually they want to see action and not words. And I think that's what we're hearing is be more, learn from this to be more proactive and not on the back foot. I have two more questions. I have uh, Cecile. Cecile V. Hello, Cecile. Yes, hi. Hello, briefly introduce yourself and what your question is. I need you both all to be brief. Perfect, thank you. I'm Cecile Bernard, I work for DSW. Uh, we're an NGO that works for, on youth empowerment, as you mentioned, especially mm -hmm. for access to health services. I want to ask a brief two questions on those two key elements that we already mentioned. So the questions for three commissioners. Uh, together with a lot of CSO uh, organization in Brussels and elsewhere, we've been asked to prioritize health and maybe through a comprehensive uh, partnership between EU and the African Union in the next summit. So a, a partnership that could be comprehensive to okay. on UNC, and your second one all the way to the research and innovation. So what it is, what do you think about this call? And is it something that you would like as, as a commissioner to see in the next partnership? And the second question is on uh, young people and women. Uh, you mentioned the demographic dividend as well, which is key to Africa and to yeah. the African Union. What do we do to really address the needs and aspiration of young people and creating decent job, but also behind this uh, and investing in, in adequate skills and making sure that they can live a healthy, healthy lives? Thank you. Cecile, thank you very much. And thank you for bringing up that issue about how do we fundamentally really, rather than just keep on talking about it, but make reality of focusing on women and girls that are key to unlocking Africa's future economic sustainable growth. Um, Etanesh. Warm welcome to you. I need you to unmute. Hello. I would like to emphasize, first of all, it is necessary to have for both sides a commission. This commission can study and what will be done can uh, study it briefly or uh, decisively. But it is good that we are uh, initiating from Europe and Africa this meeting. Etanesh, thank you for that. Whereabouts are you? 
I am in Austria. In Austria. Well, very warm. Well, thank you for making the effort to join us. And your question again, with those of you around you, if you can actually put on the, on the chat what is you'd like to see that commission to do, we would really welcome hearing from you. And thank you. Myrna, my last and final. Myrna, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very briefly, introduce yourself and My name question. is Myrna and I'm a delegate with uh, Young Mediterranean Voices. Um, I have a quick question, um, just like touching base with the pandemic and migration flows. Um, I understand that there have been like some uh, policies in the EU to thwart migration flows, but um, pandemics only creates more crises and more mig migration flows and refugees flows. So I'm at this pandemic and I'm at this uh, increase in number in detention facilities and migration detention what is the response from the eu and how the eu is helping the transition transition countries like libya for example to uh, mitigate the impact of the COVID on the refugees and migrants detained in these facilities mona where are you at the moment i'm currently in london the in United london States. okay all right thank you thank you for that question i'm not I'm, I'll, I'll come back to you on that very specific point you're going to make i'm now going to have to cut it short and I'm going to ask our commissioners to uh, provide very brief responses. Again, don't forget, use the chat function and they can also come back to you too. In one minute, Stella, I'm really sorry, Were you? can you kind of respond very briefly to some of those chunky I'll questions? Be brief because, I'll, I'll be very brief because I, I, I believe that Uta is more in a position to, to answer some of the questions. Just for the last question on migration flows, um, we, the, the EU is not uh, uh, presented a strategy yet yesterday not to support migration and definitely not in relation to the pandemic. In fact, uh, we have highlighted uh, throughout the importance to protect vulnerable populations such as migrants within, within the pandemic uh, in many of the actions that we take. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that I think that needs to be considered that they are vulnerable populations in the pandemic and we need to have special uh, actions uh, directed to them. Thank you. Okay. Um, Amira. You're muted. Quickly, okay, great. Uh, yes, very quickly. Uh, we have launched uh, the um, Africa Youth Front against COVID-19. Uh, for the engagement and the involvement of uh, the young uh, population in Africa in this fight. And we did it with the AU um, uh, Youth Envoy uh, Office, uh, and uh, they are very active in this fight. Uh, this is for the engagement of the youth. Women also are very important in the fight of COVID-19, but also we, we are looking into how to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls, because also uh, the reports are telling us that gender-based violence is increasing exactly. because of the lockdowns of this COVID-19, because of the losing of the incomes. But I will tell you that something relates to this webinar that us in the African Union and the European Union uh, and the United Nations, we have uh, signed uh, the Africa Regional Program for the Spotlight. The Spotlight Initiative is for fighting uh, gender-based violence, uh, and the initiative is coming from the European Union but the implementation will be uh, by the three uh, organizations and uh, the Africa program started already in 10 countries in, in Africa. Uh, on the issue of uh, also part of uh, overcoming uh, the impacts of COVID-19 is to look into uh, the small businesses, the SMEs, uh, to encourage more entrepreneurship programs, uh, to engage more involvement of women in this area. Uh, for the issue of the migration, I think this is a big topic. We cannot answer. We'll come back to that. Don't worry. The human, the human rights of migrants should be respected, irrespective of their legal status. That's our position in Africa. But we have uh, our mechanisms with the European uh, Union Commission. It is, uh, we are working. We have many initiatives in this area, and we are working very closely. And there is an ongoing uh, continent, continent, continent dialogue between the two commissions. Thank you. And Amira, I'm not going to ask you to come back on this, but that, that very, very uh, effective set of re responses about having much more of a collaborative commission type of approach, 
between the two um, that people are, I think, really asking for. And we heard very specifically from the, the lady in Austria about creating a commission that would actually do this. And perhaps that's just the strategy. But it, there's, there's a real urge here to actually move beyond words and have action on the ground. Yuta, I'm going to give the final words to yourself um, before we are able to say you know, what we're doing on migration and mobility anyway. But some of the key issues that were raised there that you may wish to uh, just conclude this debate. Thanks a lot, and thanks for this uh, very interesting uh, debate. I think there was a lot of uh, interesting perspective and, and also new information for me. So thanks for these uh, excellent interventions, uh, also from the from the ground and from the field. First, I wanted to uh, just remind us that uh, we will collect all the messages, all the questions, all the remarks from the chat box, mm -hmm. and, and we will go then through. So I think it's it's important to know that, you know, you are able to really contribute, even though you, you are only, you know, writing to the chat box. Then the other point, I think, you know, this um, industrialization uh, yeah. uh, question was very, very interesting. Mm. And, and that's, of course, something we have been uh, discussing a lot with our African partners that, you know, how are we able to get new, uh, especially private investments uh, to Africa? And I think, you know, uh, when I have also spoken with some of the CEOs, uh, especially in Europe, mm. I think, you know, they quite often raise a couple of uh, aspects. Uh, the first one is stability, that, you know, if they are going to invest, so they need to know that the, the, the society at the country is stable. The other one is uh, predictability. Mm. And then the third one, I think, is uh, that, you know, what kind of work, 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 uh, work uh, force they are able to uh, offer so that, you know, are the citizens educated? And I think this is a very important part of the uh, main topic, human development, uh, which we haven't really discussed today. But you know, how are we able to provide African young people to access education? Yep. And not any kind of education, but really uh, high quality, well uh, qualified education, where you know the teachers are, are, are qualified and, and and so on. And uh, I think you know these are the yeah. aspects uh, very often raised uh, from the business uh, sector when I'm discussing with them that how are we able to decrease the threshold in order to bro uh, boost uh, uh, investments uh, to to Africa. But of course these are. The topics I think we are going to discuss also in our summit, in the European Union, African Union summit next year, that, you know, uh, how are we able to maybe build up an investment package mm. in order to uh, help the recovery in, in Africa uh, together with African countries. The last point I wanted to make is uh, the, the role of the young people. I think uh, we had a great first session yes. <laughs> on, on youth and, and young people. And uh, I can only ensure you that uh, youth will be uh, one of the main priorities for us in the coming program. Because we, if we only look at the demographics in, in Africa, exactly. half of the, 60% of the population are under 30 years old. In Sahel region, uh, half of the population are under 16 years old. So I think uh, what we need to do is that uh, we need to provide them uh, education, access to education, but also access to basic services. Mm. And, um, and, and, but not only that, we mm. need to also create this way to be part of the society, yes. like this kind of youth participation. Mm. And, um, and I, I, I have some you know, uh, concrete ideas how to do that together, uh, of course, with our partner countries. But I can ensure you that that will be part of the uh, uh, coming uh, programming process. Yuta, thank you. You've just whetted our appetite. You, the, the way you said you've got some concrete ideas, I think people were saying, yes, we're looking forward to that. But I know that we'll have that debate again as we move forward. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you on Zoom and our live stream. Uh, without you and uh, not your, your engagement, these debates wouldn't be alive. And thank you for being honest and direct. Please do use the chat function. Uh, as Yuta said, we will, there, there will be a collection of this and respond to some of the issues that you've heard. And can continue chatting. Um, thank you, commissioners, for being with us. It's been very, very uh, heartening. Uh, your messaging, your leadership, your, the, what you're saying about what needs to happen is a message that I think world leaders need to listen to and act on more so. Um, the debate uh, that we're going to have, we're not going to lose sight of this. Uh, we will, uh, Yuta and I were discussing this, that there
there will be a debate on migration and mobility. Commissioner Johansson wasn't able to be here today, unfortunately, but we will have a debate specifically um, on that very uh, important issue as we move forward. So, without further ado, keep an eye on our website. Look forward to next Thursday, same time, same place, and see you then. Take care, be safe, and look after yourself. Thank you very much for joining Friends of Europe's debate on Debating Africa. Bye-bye.